Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Hayekadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and the Holy Bible, praise God, is our only standard and authority for truth. And together, God's people say, Hallelujah. Well, friends, today is December the 27th in the year of our Lord, 2017, and this is one a day for the soul. Now, we are continuing our study through the book of Romans, and Paul has been teaching us the difference between grace and the law, the carnal and the spirit, the man of God and the man of the flesh. And as we last learned in the beginning verses of chapter 8, we are told in verse 5, they that are after the flesh mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit mind the things of the spirit. To be carnally minded is death, to be spiritually minded is life and peace. The carnal mind is at war against God, the spiritual mind is at peace with God. But if you claim to be born again, if you claim to be a follower of Jesus, then you have a responsibility to live up to. And so you do not walk according to the flesh, but you walk according to the Spirit. For if any man does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Now these are very challenging words, friends. Words that should cause us to want to look deep into ourselves and examine ourselves to make sure that we aren't wearing the banner of Christianity like someone would wear the banner of a Republican or a Democrat. And unfortunately, that's what many do. Because of their upbringings, because of their traditions, they consider themselves a Christian in title not in the sacrifices and the self-denial that being a follower of Jesus is truly all about, what it truly requires. And Paul tells us in verse 17 that if we are willing to pay the price, if we walk as Jesus walked, then we become heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. But if we're going to walk as Jesus walked, it is going to require a life of suffering. And that's why he says in verse 18, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time, the sacrifices that we make, the self-denial that we commit ourselves unto, these things are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And so these are words of encouragement that Paul is writing to this young church. And he's also writing to all the readers throughout the history of time. And so let's talk about that for a moment. Because in Western culture and in free society, we really know very little about what many have known in suffering for the name of Jesus. You see, there was no higher mark for those in the early church. There was no higher badge of honor than to suffer for Jesus. That's why Paul tells the Philippian church in chapter 1, verse 27, let your manner of living, in the King James Version that says conversation, but it has very little to do with our speech. It's speaking of our manner of living. Let your manner of living be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, the doctrine of Christ, the teaching of Christ, that you may stand fast, stand strong in one spirit with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. But if you do this, this is going to cost you. So don't be terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition or destruction. They think that they're accomplishing something by persecuting you and even killing you. But to you, this is a form of salvation because it has been given to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but to suffer for his sake. Now, in the very way that it says it's been given unto you, Paul is confirming to the young believer, to the follower of Jesus, that it is an honor to suffer and to die for Jesus. That's why Paul, speaking of himself in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, in verse 18, he says, Seeing that many glory after the flesh, I will glory also. He says in verse 23, Are they ministers of Christ? Well, I am more. 
in labors and hard work for Jesus, I am more abundant. In stripes, above measure. In prisons, more frequent. In deaths, often. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Three times have I been beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times shipwrecked. I have made many journeys. I have been in perils of waters and robbers. By mine own countrymen, by the heathen. In the city, in the wilderness, in the sea. Among false brothers. I've suffered weariness and I've suffered pain. I've suffered hunger and thirst. I've been cold and naked, yet back to verse 18, I glory in these things. And so what we see through these passages, that there's no greater honor to stand before the Lord Jesus on that great and glorious day to come than with stripes upon our back, scars upon our face where we've been beaten in his name, for his name. And that's why Paul tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, that if we stand for the Lord Jesus, if we defy this world, its ways and its practices, if we live godly in Christ Jesus, we shall suffer persecution. And so back to Romans chapter 8, verse 18, Paul says, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature, that would be you and I, friends. We wait for the manifestation of the sons of God. We wait for the day of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you remember what we're told in Matthew chapter 24, Luke chapter 21, Mark chapter 13, and Revelation chapter 6? All of these give us the account of what the day of the Lord will be like. And in Matthew 24, verse 29, it says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened. The moon will not give her light. The stars shall fall from heaven. The powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then, immediately after the tribulation of those days, will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And notice in verse 31, He shall send his angels, or the sons of God, with a great sound of a trumpet. They shall gather together his elect from the four corners, from one end of heaven to the other. And this is what Paul is referring to in verse 19 of Romans 8. We, with earnest expectation, wait for the manifestation of the angels who will call the elect home. For the creature, you and I, were made subject to vanity. We were placed under the curse of sin, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. Now, friends, I'm not a theologian, and so I can only take from this verse what it says as it says it. And what it seems to be saying to me is that the creature, you and I, were placed under the curse of sin. We were made subject to vanity. But notice that it says not willingly. You see, when God created man, God in his knowledge knew that man would defy him. He knew that man would rebel against him. And so he already had a plan in place where Jesus, his son, would die for mankind, for the sins of the world. And that's why the Bible tells us that even before time began, it was appointed for Jesus to die. And so this verse seems to be saying that we were predestined to rebel against God, but because of God who has subjected the creature to be under the curse of sin, in pre-planning the sacrifice of Jesus, hope will come back to man. Hope of reconciliation, hope of being brought back into fellowship with God, and because of that reconciliation, hope of living eternally in his favor. And that's why Paul continues in verse 21, he says, because the creature, you and I, will be delivered from the bondage of corruption, from the curse of sin. 
and we will be brought, we will be ushered into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that it is not only the children of God who groan and travail in pain together, but all of creation groans and travails in pain. All of creation groans and travails and awaits the day of the Savior of the world, of the Creator, to restore things back to the way they originally were. And so in verse 23, we wait for the adoption to wit or to know the redemption of our body, to leave this cursed vile body that longs after the way of sin and to receive our glorified bodies. And this is what we look for. This is what we hope for. For we are saved by hope. And hope is something that we see with the eye of faith. It has not yet been revealed to us. For if a man seeth what he hopes for, then that nullifies the hope, because hope that is seen is not hope. But in verse 25, if we hope for what we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. And the Spirit has been given unto us to help us patiently wait for it, to help us in our infirmities, our weaknesses. For we know not, because we have not seen it yet, what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession on our behalf, with groanings that cannot be uttered. But God, who searches the hearts, knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Now remember, the context of the passage is suffering for standing for Jesus, for standing for his truth for standing in opposition to this world, because its message is not one of Christ, but it is anti-Christ. And so the spirit of the living God is here to assist us in our times of trouble, in our times of suffering, pain, and misery. And we know in verse 28 that all the things that we suffer work together for good to them who love God, to those who are suffering for God to them who have been called according to his purpose. For he foreknew them, and he has predestinated. He is the one who has coordinated and ordained their lives even before they began to live. So their suffering is in the plan of God for their lives. And this is how they are to be conformed to the image of his son, Jesus, who also suffered violently at the hands of this world. Now, not only has he predestinated us for these times of suffering, but he's called us unto these times of suffering. And those whom he has called, he has justified. He renders righteous. And those whom he has justified or rendered righteous, he also glorifies. They shine in the likeness of Jesus because they are suffering as Jesus did in standing for truth. So what shall we say? If God is for us, no matter what man can do to us, who can be against us? They can destroy our bodies, but they cannot destroy our souls. They can take everything from us, but they cannot take eternal life. Now God, who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? In other words, if he did not spare his son in the suffering that he endured, what makes us think that we're going to be spared from the suffering that is to come to us as we stand for Jesus and his truth? But just as Jesus' life did not end in the grave, he received all things promised unto him, and now he lives in victory above sin and above death, so shall not we also? For who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? And this is why Jesus our Lord said, don't fear men who can kill the body, but fear God who can kill thy soul. For all man can take is the body, but it is God that can take the soul. 
And so if we stand boldly in our confession for the Lord Jesus, even in the greatest moments of persecution, if we will confess him before man, even in the face of death, great will be our reward in the kingdom. In this life, we are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. We live among our enemy, so we shouldn't expect to be favored by them. For what is highly esteemed or favored before men is an abomination before God, said Jesus. So in all these times of suffering, in all these tribulations, in all these distresses, persecutions, nakedness, famine, in all these perils, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so the message simply here is, friend, fear nothing in this life. Fear God. Walk humbly before him. Remain surrendered with a heart of servitude to all that you meet. For it is not reward that we are looking for in this life, but in the life to come. What wonderful words of encouragement, friends, that no matter what comes our way in this life, Jesus is on the throne. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. The battle has been won. The victory is his. And if we will surrender before him, he includes us in that victory. We are on the winning side, hallelujah. And so lift your eyes, friends. Place not your affections, your passions, your attractions upon the things of this world, but look higher. Hunger for righteousness and truth. Flee this world. Cling to the cross. Truly love others when they hate you most. Pray for your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Remain low and humble in your attitudes. For this is the spirit of our Lord Jesus. This is what we have been called unto. And great will be our reward for doing so. Hallelujah, friends. What a wonderful, wonderful word of comfort and encouragement. Well, I'm so grateful that again you are with us today. And I pray that the Spirit of the Lord has blessed you, enlightened you, and challenged you in your journey as you seek to walk faithfully as a follower of the Lord Jesus. Now, as he wills, and until next time, friends, I truly love you. I'll see you on the next video.